Hi everybody, welcome back. We're looking today at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, starting off with chapter 5 on the subject of adjectives. Before we do that though, a quick apology and a quick thank you. Uh, those of you who will have been watching some of the previous videos may have noticed that there's a bit of a gap between the publication of the previous one at the end of chapter 4 and starting this one. I'm really sorry about that. After all the encouragement I gave you to keep at it 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day, there's me with a bit of a hectic year but no excuse really for being off for so long when I tried to keep up with it coming fairly, uh, with the videos coming fairly regularly. So I'm sorry about that and a thank you also, thank you to those of you uh, here and elsewhere uh, who've uh, it, written to me or been encouraging in various other ways uh, to get back to these videos. Uh, please pray for me that I'm able to keep up with them. I'm going to try again and crack on with it and maybe this will be an encouragement to you. If you've um, taken a break from it, been a bit discouraged either following these videos along or you're watching them at some later date and you've been a bit discouraged and you want to get back into it, well, if you've slowed down a little bit and you need to restart, restart now and let's get going again. So we're going to start then with chapter 5 on the subject of adjectives. Just section 5.1 today. I want to just introduce adjectives for those of you who may not have had a formal training in grammar and then talk a little bit about the various ways in which they're used which will give us an overview of the chapter as a whole and then just talk about the issue of formation of adjectives, the shape or the form of them. So firstly, uh, what is an adjective? An adjective is a word that describes a noun. Very simple. An adjective is a word that describes a noun. So for example, um, here's a sentence in English. the good man or the beautiful child. The adjective in these sentences is good in the first, they're not sentences actually, <laughs> the adjectives in these phrases are good and beautiful. What am I doing in that? There we are. Beautiful. Typos and mistakes in the first video back. How terrible is that? Right, so the good man. You can also imagine using adjectives in a slightly different way. The man is foolish. Or, in a slightly different way, again, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All of these are uh, different ways of using adjectives. And these correspond to the three different ways in which adjectives are used in this chapter. So let me say a word or two about those. The first way in which we used uh, uh, an adjective, let's go back to a sentence like this, the foolish man. This is called the attributive use of the adjective. It's the first one that Duff uh, talks about and it's uh, called attributive because the adjective here, foolish, describes an attribute of the noun that it modifies. So it's called the attributive use, attributive use of the adjective because it describes an attribute of the noun. That's the first and most simple and obvious way in which an adjective can be used. Here's uh, the second way, just to look at that, let's change colour bit of variety. Um, the woman is wise. This is called the predicative use of the adjective. Predicative use of the adjective. So called because you are predicating wiseness or wisdom of the woman. The giveaway in this sentence is the appearance of the verb to be. The woman is wise. And notice here, therefore, this is a complete sentence, unlike the previous ones, which are just little phrases, because it's got a verb in it. The woman is wise. Now, what this means, therefore, in order to understand and in order to use uh, nouns, uh, get it straight, in order to use adjectives uh, predicatively, we're going to need to learn the verb is or the verb to be in general and that accounts for why the verb to be comes up in this chapter in chapter 5. It's a somewhat irregular verb but it's so common that you're very quickly used to it and though it will feel a little bit odd to begin with you'll soon get over the oddness and it'll feel very natural. So attributive describing an attribute of the noun, predicative predicating something or saying something about the noun and finally the one that we tend to forget about, because it's not quite so common in English, 
Although it does tend to be quite common uh, in Greek, I'm not sure exactly of the statistics how common it is. What you might call the substantive use of the noun, of the adjective, I'm doing it again, the substantive use of the adjective, that is using the adjective as a noun. Like this, the meek shall inherit the earth. Where's the adjective in this sentence? Just pause a second, you can very quickly see it, can't you? The meek. Meek is the adjective. And what's happened here is the adjective is being used to label a class of things, or people in this case, which have the property of meekness. To, to label a group of things, or it could be an individual thing uh, in theory, um, the meek is used in the place of a noun, and it's all those things or all those people that have this property of being meek. This is called the substantive, substantive use of the adjective. And it's called a substantive use of the adjective because a substantive is anything which is like a noun, in grammar at least. In grammar, substantive refers to a noun or a noun-like thing, like a pronoun, or in this case, an adjective. Now, what's the giveaway here? Well, the giveaway in predicative use of the adjective, remember, was the verb to be. Although, as we shall see when we get to that section, sometimes that verb disappears and so you have to figure out that it's there. But don't worry about that, we'll get to it. The giveaway with the substantive use of the, uh, of the adjective is the, the article. In English, the definite article, but in Greek, of course, there's only one article, so we just refer to the article. So, just to summarise then, uh, what we've done so far, the attributive use of the adjective describes an attribute of the noun, the good man, the wise woman. The predicative use predicates something of the noun. The woman is beautiful, the child is naughty. And the substantive use uses the article to describe a, a group of things or a class of things that have the property of the adjective. The meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, so now you know what an adjective is. You know the three basic ways in which adjectives can be used. We haven't yet written a single word in Greek on the board, and the reason for that is because, well, that's what we're coming on to. Now, there's good news and there's bad news here when it comes to the form of a, an adjective. The bad news is you have to learn masculine and feminine and neuter forms of all the adjectives. And the reason is fairly obvious, isn't it? Because every adjective needs to be able to describe nouns that are masculine and nouns that are feminine and nouns that are neuter. And the principle of agreement means that we need, therefore, to be able to write masculine and feminine and neuter forms of all the adjectives. So unlike with something like a noun like logos, where you've just got to learn nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, singular and plural, with a, an adjective, like here, the example that um, Duff gives is agathos, meaning good. With an adjective, you've got to learn nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, singular and plural, times three, masculine, feminine, and neuter. So you've got that big chunky table there at the bottom of page 55. So there's the bad news. You've got four times two, eight times three, 24 different things to learn. But there's some good news. The good news is you know this already. And if you glance at that table, if you've got it in front of you, you will probably have spotted already that you know it. But if you haven't, or if you're cheating and not, not got the book in front of you, I will write it on the board for you because I'm that nice kind of guy. Let's um, just give ourselves a little table here. Masculine, feminine, neuter. Remembering that in general, it's a good idea if you can always to lay your tables out in the same, in the same kind of way. Masculine, feminine, neuter. Um, because it will help you to remember things. Okay, then we're going to go nominative, accusative, genitive, dative, and then we'll do the same, that's singular, and then nominative, accusative, genitive, dative for the plural. Okay, now if you imagine a, a noun that is masculine, a noun that you know, like logos, well, you could all write this straight out, logos, logon, Logu. Oh dear, that needs to be a new with a pointy base, and that needs to be an upsilon with a round base. There we are. Logu, 
logo, logoi, logus, logon, logois. So you know those endings already, you get them directly from the nouns. Well, when you use uh, an adjective like agathos and you're trying to construct its endings, it's so simple, it hardly needs saying. You simply replace the stem of the noun with the stem of the adjective. So, like this. Agathos, agathon, agathu, agatho, agatho, agathus, agathon, agathois. Couldn't be simpler, could it? You know this already. And therefore, if we were trying to um, uh, construct the column here and the column there, you might want to try and do that now without looking at the table at the bottom of page 55. Just think of a feminine noun that you know, like arche, a beginning, um, or a neuter noun that you know, like ergon, a work, or a deed. And so you'd write it out like this. Oh, there we go, gone green. Arche, and then you continue the declension down. Arche, arcan, arches, arche. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you can see what that's supposed to be. Archai, Arcas, Arcon, Archais. Well, what are we going to do? Very simple. We're just going to replace the stem of the noun with the stem of the adjective in exactly the same way. Agathe, Agathen, Agathes, Agathe, Agathai, Agathas, Agathon, Agathais. Do I need to write out the one in the neuter? Well, go on, just for completeness. So you have it here in a minute. You'll have it right at the end of the video. It'll be sitting here. So um, uh, imagine a neuter noun that you know, um, like uh, ergon. Oh dear, there we are. Ergon. And then you decline that. Er, uh, er, ergon. Dear, oh dear. Ergon. Uh, go, uh, go. What's the neuter plural, nominative and accusative? Yeah, you know. Uh, ga, uh, ga, uh, gon, uh, gois. So what are you going to do here? Again, so simple that you don't need me to show you, but I will anyway. You just slap the stem of the adjective in the place of the stem of the noun, and that gives you the entire table. So there we are, take a look at that if you've not got your book with you, and that will help you to remember this. Now, a couple of final points, just um, looking over the page to page 56, you will remember that when you have a feminine noun whose stem ends in a vowel or a row, then something strange happens to the endings. Do you remember, uh, if you have uh, a, vow, uh, a noun like uh, hemera, let's pick a colour, let's go black because we haven't had that, hemera, hemera, the endings in the feminine form of the noun, hemera, hemeran, hemeras, Hemera, and then in the plural form, they're exactly the same. So in the feminine singular form of nouns with stems that end in a row or a vowel, the singular form of the ending is an alpha ending, not an eta ending. Hemera, hemeran, hemeras, hemera. Now, what would you expect, therefore, to happen in the case of an adjective that ends, whose stem ends in a row or a vowel. Well, let's just have a look. You can see right at the top of page 56, um, if you have a adjective like hagios, meaning holy, well, if you put the adjective in here, for consistency, let's stay blue, hagios, hagion, hagiu, hagio, etc. But here, Oh dear, who spotted that? Well done. That's what happens when you don't do Greek videos for a year, you forget everything. Ha, 
Hagi a hagian, hagias, hagia, hagiai, hagias, hagion, hagiais. Hagia meaning holy, as in Hagia Sophia. It's a common name for um, churches in some parts of Europe, the, the holy wisdom. Okay, so if you've got an adjective whose stem ends in a vowel or a row, then the endings in the feminine singular have the alpha form, not the eta form. Now, you might therefore wonder what happens if you have a word, uh, an adjective that whose stem ends in something with a s sound. You remember um, uh, what happens with uh, doxa, meaning glory, the noun, it goes doxa, doxan, doxes, doxe. The s sound is associated with, mi with mixed endings. That's a little mnemonic for you to help you remember. If the stem ends in a s sound, ks or a s, then da 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 da, alpha, alpha, eta, eta. What would happen with adjectives that had a stem ending in a s sound? You'd have the same thing, but it just turns out, as Duff says uh, at the end of that first paragraph on page 56, that there are no adjectives, at least not in the New Testament, whose endings go like doxa, no adjectives with a sigma or a s sound at the end of the stem. So you don't need to worry about that. So there you are. Very, very straightforward. You know what adjectives are. You know the three different ways in which they're used. And those are the three different ways that we're going to come on to in the next uh, few videos throughout this chapter. And now you've got a little summary and a bit of a rationale and explanation for the form. So keep at it. Keep praying for me that I would keep at it. 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five, six days a week. And we will have you reading the New Testament in Greek in no time at all. God bless. Bye for now.